Hello, my name is Reginald Bullock, and I am the author of Father to Son, A Guide to Growing Up in a Difficult World. This next chapter, Mothers, some would say, how do you put that chapter in the book, Father to Son? You know, you talk about mothers. Well, you know what? My mother raised me, and she did it without any help from my father. I never met him. I'm a bastard. And so out of respect for her and the many single parent mothers that are out there who only know the struggles that they go through better than anybody else. Nobody really knows the struggle that a single parent mother goes through other than another single parent mother. Because me as a son, a young black male, I know I put my mother through some shit. <laughs> so... And I have a lot of friends who are also young black males raised by a single parent mother, and they put their mothers through some stuff as well. So this chapter honors the mother, but it also talks a little bit about, um, and this gets real controversial, you know, a mother can raise a son, a mother can raise a boy, a mother can raise a child, but a mother can't raise a man. Now I know right away everybody's going to get mad at me, right? Well, you know what? It takes one to know one. You know, uh, can a lion raise a zebra? No. <laughs> All right. So there are a lot of things that, in my opinion, as a father raising a son, and this is my opinion, that um, females don't know because they don't experience the same thing. They don't have the same level of testosterone. They don't have the same same internal organs, working parts. They don't have the same mindset, you know, when puberty changes. So it's a lot of things that just only men know. We go through, you know, men go through that. Um, now, women can study, read, learn, and everything else. And, you know, for the most part, my mom raised me, right? But there's a whole lot of gaps that uh, were missing and still are missing uh, because they're just things she couldn't do, questions she couldn't answer. Uh, but she did her best, and I think she did good. So it's not a slam. It's just a reality from my perspective. Enjoy the chapter. Chapter 10. Mothers. I'll always love my mama because she's my favorite girl. You only get one. You only get one, yeah. Intruders. Indeed, my mother is my favorite girl. Without her, not only would I not be here, I would not have had children. Thousands of people whom I have affected and have affected over my lifetime would not have been influenced by me nor I by them, thus altering many things in their lives as well as mine, and so on and so on and so on. Thanks, Mom. Being a mother has got to be the most thankless job in the world. Children put their mothers through so much, it is almost unbelievable and definitely unfair. A mother will do almost anything for her child, unconditionally. Most men owe their mothers so much money they have lost track of the amount. A mother knows secrets about you. You do not even know she knows. Remember what I said about keeping a secret. Every mother risks her own life just to give birth. Although one of my very close friends, who is a gynecologist, is more qualified to elaborate on the subject of birth than I will ever be, no one but the mother should decide to risk her life to produce another. I could go on and on about many aspects of being a mother from what I have observed over the years. However, I am concerned with addressing just a few specific points as it relates to a mother's son. A mother can raise her child. A mother can raise a boy and a mother can raise her son. The one thing she cannot do is raise a man. Let us get serious about this matter and allow me to open your mind to some cold, hard facts. When a young man's penis gets erect and he does not understand why his body is acting that way, what do you say? Can a mother really explain how to get the erection back down and deal with all the hundreds of questions that follow? If you do not know what I am talking about, unless you are a maturing young boy, you will never understand. What about show and tell? Boys naturally observe older men because they are curious to find out what is in store for them when they reach manhood. How do you know the difference between a small penis and a large penis? All young men are constantly growing and 
want to know how long it will take for their penis to get to a size where they can feel proud. Moreover, not be embarrassed. That is where fathers come in. It is a man thing, like father, like son. Not only can a father answer these questions for a son, he can do it with such directness and tact that the son will still feel comfortable asking questions. A mother just cannot do it. When I was a camp counselor, I used to overhear the young men talk about all sorts of growing pains. If no one gives them a decent answer, they will make up answers, usually wrong. How many mothers do you know will have their 14-year-old son naked in front of them while they are also naked in a locker room? Perhaps after finishing up a game of basketball and explain the various parts of his body to him. Then there is the sexual growth. Although men and women both enjoy sex, they approach it totally differently, especially at the teenager stage. The average penis starts practicing its erection involuntarily just after birth, to the best of my knowledge. No mother knows how that feels, unless she is a hermaphrodite. For what purpose does a penis get erect? Other than to embarrass you when you stand up sometimes, it is for sexual intercourse. If a young man's penis practices this routine of getting erect several times a day and in his sleep every day for his entire life, he is going to want to know why. After he finds out why, he is going to want to find out how it works. It is that simple. If you owned an interesting tool all your life and finally found out what it was used for, wouldn't you want to test it out? A father can not only explain the phenomenon of an erection, he can give personal examples to help a son feel that he is not suffering an isolated growth deficiency or efficiency. All men go through it. Depending on the stage of a young man when he starts to ask questions, it might also be a good time to discuss sex, safe sex, and no sex. A mother will say, do not have sex until you are older, grown, or some other type of excuse to get them to wait. A father will reflect on his youth and try to figure out how to prevent his son from having sex as young as he did, knowing the urge and desires are all there. I remember a young man whom I ended up being a role model mentor for. He and I used to discuss all sorts of things. Most of the time, it was the kind of conversations that his mother would not or could not talk about. As he got to be about 13 or 14 years of age, he started developing interest in girls. I would probe every now and then about him holding hands, kissing with the mouth open or closed, and if he was having sex. Because of our father-to-son or big brother-type trust and relationship, he would always be honest with me. After coaching it out of him sometimes, but he told me the truth. No, he was not having sex. One Christmas, he and his mother invited my family, including my mother, over for dinner. He was still about 13 or 14 years of age. We all exchanged gifts, and the one gift that caused the most excitement was the gift he received from his grandmother, who was also present at the dinner. His grandmother gave him a box of penis protectors, condoms. His mother almost had a heart attack. She snatched the box out of his hand and became hysterical. His mother was so upset at her mother for giving her son such a gift, they had to separate from each other for a few minutes. My mother and I sort of looked at each other and smiled. It was a sight to see. Because of the emotions bubbling over, I decided to wait for another day to explain to the young man all about his grandmother's thoughtful gift and why his mother got emotional. His mother was scared, as many mothers are, when they realize their son is becoming a man. Now, on the flip side of the coin, I cannot really explain all that goes through a mother's head during that time. Perhaps some mothers have had bad experiences with sex when they were young girls and do not want their sons to do the same to someone else. Perhaps it was a painful or unpleasant experience. Perhaps they were raped. Perhaps they just know the way girls think and what they talk about and do not want their sons to be the talk of the town. I do not know the reasons because I am not a woman. Just as I am not qualified to teach and show my daughter how to deal with her first and subsequent menstrual cycles due to my lack of experience, there are similar factors with a mother and her son. While understanding the penis and the sexual curiosity of a boy is difficult, 
so is handling his masculinity. I've learned from experience and observation that a mother cannot control a 16-year-old son unless he wants to be controlled. If he does not want to be controlled, the mother will lose. A boy becomes a man by nature's definition somewhere around age 15. His strength is developing so rapidly that even he does not know what his true capabilities are. One thing is for certain. He is closer to being a man than he is a boy. This is the stage that has caused our nation to have the problems it has. This is the stage that only a father can handle. The guns, the drugs, the dropouts, the teenage pregnancies, the violence, the crimes, the murders, the problems, the problems on top of problems are out of control at this stage. Mothers have no control. The cities have no control. The states have no control. The government has no control. This is where the mother watches all her work and effort go down the drain. This is where a mother searches her mind endlessly to see where she went wrong. This is where she is forced to make the most difficult decision of her life, the decision of disowning her son, putting him out, sometimes even having him arrested. This is where she becomes numb. For this reason alone, I cannot see why young unmarried teenage girls feel that having a baby at a young age will make them feel grown. When she turns 30, she might be living the worst nightmare of her life. Babies having babies is like playing Russian roulette. If your number pops up, your life is over. Why? After all a mother has done for her son, why? It is simple. The father did not do his job. The father is the only one who can control the son at this stage. Look around at how well all of our glorious institutions are doing. They are all failing at their mission statement while pointing the finger at the families and communities. A father is the only one who can solve the crisis we are having. As a father, I have solved the problems of a son for many mothers, some temporary and some permanently. I had to alter their thinking process so that their mothers could have some degree of control. I did not necessarily use force, I used affection. We need all fathers to step in and do the same. When I say fathers, I'm not necessarily talking about a man living in the same house with the mother and son. Sometimes this cannot always be the case. I have a friend who has been married twice and has three children between two wives. He has since divorced and is now looking for a third wife. Although he is not living with his children, he does anything and everything he can for them. He loves his children more than he loves himself. He has just given his first wife $20,000 towards buying a house, and after practically purchasing it for her, she is now asking for another $10,000 to go into the house. I asked him, why did he buy the house for her? He said because he wanted his children to live in a better neighborhood with less negative influences. He has told me many sad stories about his former wife. I had to ask him why did he marry her if she had so many problems. He said because she was pregnant with his child and he wanted to do the right thing. I told him that is one of the reasons why divorce rates are so high now. Son, there are women out there who will get pregnant purposely to snare a good man. What most people fail to realize is that Marriage is supposed to be permanent. It is supposed to be two-sided, not one-sided. It is supposed to be for the rest of your life, for better or for worse, until death do you part. Do not marry because it seems like the right thing to do. You will only hurt the mother and the child in the long run. While working as a public housing manager at the Philadelphia Housing Authority, I had the opportunity to witness firsthand Hundreds of single parent mothers trying to raise their sons. I've seen parents who really wanted to help their sons, but were helpless to the situations. The sons would come and go as they pleased. Some would disrespect their mothers in their face. They would not only take their mother's money, they would sell off some of their mother's possessions. I have seen seven year old sons ignore, curse, and at sometimes even strike their mother. Yes. I taught them a quick lesson on manhood when it happened in my presence. However, the behavior was ingrained. 
I have had to contact various agencies to investigate child neglect of some of my tenants. On one occasion, the agency had to take the children from the mother because of the documented repeat infractions. The mother just left her children in the house while she went out to do her own things, such as drugs and other enterprising activities. The children who grow up in these sort of environments are no different than a child who grows up in a middle-class environment with two parent families. They will imitate what they see and hear. They want to be accepted by the dominating social structure of their environment. Good, bad, or indifferent, you are a product of your environment. The young men on the corner selling drugs learned it from other young men on the corner selling drugs, not their mother. Most females are no match physically for men their age. Therefore, since only the strong survive, young men dominate the drug trade and territories. Since the only one who can really challenge the young men and change their behavior is another man, in most cases, a mother is helpless. Go to any housing development at night and just watch what goes on and who is doing it. Even if the women are selling themselves, it is the man who is running the show. If more fathers would take responsibility of their responsibilities, then these problems would not be as great as they have become. When contemplating responsibility of a child out of wedlock, always try to keep the child's interest at heart. As a matter of fact, the child's interest should come before yours. It would be wiser to either take full custody of the child if it is a boy or have equal custody. The main thing is to own up to your responsibility and help raise your child. I could go on a tangent about responsible sex. However, that will not solve the problem after the fact. The bottom line is that both the mother and father have to be mature about bringing a new life into the world and do what is best for the child. The child will be happier, the parents will be happier, and there will be less stress overall. Speaking of less stress, most mothers whose son joins the military and come back home feel so proud of their son because of the change. The change seems drastic because the last time she saw him, he was what she was used to seeing, an unattended son. The next time she sees him, he is very different. What she is looking at that is so different, that is so rewarding, is a man. She is looking at her son as a man, in most cases for the first time. A sharp, clean-cut, mannerable, grown-up man. He is not only a man to be proud of, but also one to be respected. The military training instructor or drill sergeant is their father for the entire time of the training process. He sleeps, eats, walks, runs, works, trains, fights, cries, hurts, bleeds, and even dies with them. He does not do it just because it is his job. He does it out of love. The love of his country, the love of his profession, and the love of his fellow man. After he has made a boy into a man, he then passes him onto another fatherly figure who helps to continue his development process. I know there are female MTIs who have done outstanding jobs training their trainees, and I commend them for their efforts. However, if you were to ask a soldier what went through his mind when he spoke to him, you might be surprised at the answer. The level of respect is not the same for a non-fatherly figure. Turning boys to men is one of the reasons I became an Air Force recruiter. In spite of all the attacks I took because of a few bad apples in the recruiting service, I was proud to be in the position to transform boys into men. I was the door. Through me passed many boys who became men. I did not just put them in the Air Force. That would have limited me. I put them in the Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, National Guards, active duty, and reserve. Although my first priority was putting them in the Air Force, those who did not qualify still needed help. So I helped them. Besides, it is a good feeling to help young men who are searching for direction. It is a feeling I wish I could share with everyone. It is the kind of feeling that sends goose pimples down your back and tears down your face. God may have created us and women may have given birth to us, but men have made men. That is my job. The job of a father, not a mother. 
I commend the boot camp theory and whomever was instrumental in finally bringing a good idea to reality. The structure will need to be constantly improved with focus and a sense of direction for those it is intended to reform. It is a sensitive project, one which I hope this government takes seriously. Given the wrong decisions made on its behalf, it could also become a failure. I challenge that institution to transform boys to men. I challenge that institution to educate those men at the college level so that they will be equipped with the real ammunition to fight in this world. I also challenge the boot camp instruction to act as a placement service to give the newly reformed and transformed young men jobs, housing, and dignity when they are released, rather than just releasing them back to whence they came. In the chapter on money and education, I talk about the psychology of what it does to a young man and, to some degree, how to gain control. However, in this society, sometimes a person has lost the battle before even beginning due to their social status or some other circumstance. Many young men who have a record are basically good young men. Unfortunately, they were at the wrong place at the wrong time with no representation to assist them. As a result, they are sucked into the system. Now they are permanently marked. How do you permanently remove that mark so that you can compete equally and fairly in this world? To rehabilitate a person is one thing. To train, educate, and develop them is a responsibility. If the mother was not able to do it, then who can? The men that are rehabilitating them. It should be a comprehensive philosophy to strengthen our young men. That way, when he becomes an old man, he will not only be more productive, he will be able to pass on the knowledge he has acquired from a positive standpoint. As a boy grows older, his most inner desires and fears are that of becoming a man. He wants so much to be respected as a man. He knows it takes time, but he just does not want to wait. Before a young man gets to the point where a mother cannot handle him, a mother needs to find a man. Not for herself, but for her son. A man who is willing to provide guidance and help with the difficult task of making a man. A mother just does not have the experience. I remember being told by several men whom I have challenged when I was a boy, Reggie, I have been your age, but you have never been mine. I have been a boy, but you have yet to become a man. My mother has and still does remind me that I have never been her age. However, she has never told me once that she was a man. Always love your mother. You only get one.